I don't know what it's like here in Michigan, but back in California, there's a lot of companies that tell you you can dial these 900 numbers and get your personal psychic reader. Do you have that out here too? Yes? No? Yeah? I think I told you one of my friends called one of these numbers. The first thing they said is, can we have your credit card number? He said, you're the prophet. You tell me. The book of Revelation pictures three angels speeding to our planet. They carry urgent messages of warning and hope to prepare us for Jesus' return. These divine prophecies provide us with a vivid window revealing future events for our world. In God's word, a special blessing is promised for all who seek to understand these prophecies. With this in mind, Amazing Facts brings you a new revelation with Doug Batchelor. Author and TV host Doug Batchelor has thrilled thousands around the world with these fascinating presentations. This new Revelation seminar is a complete Bible study the whole family will enjoy. Clear-cut logic, spontaneous humor, and beautifully illustrated study guides will bring the Bible to life as never before. Today's message, Does God Inspire Astrologers and Psychics? And now, a new Revelation. Someone is wondering, you know, how does God feel about uh, sterilization and birth control? Uh, I am vehemently against abortion because I believe that once conception takes place, there is sacred human life there, and you can't say, well, because it's a little human, it doesn't matter. That would mean that zombies are more, or Zulus are more valuable than pygmies because they're taller. Uh, the idea that because the fetus is small, it stops being human, you, you can't fly that argument. But before, before um, conception takes place, I believe that a person who... You know, the Lord tells us to be intelligent, to reason. I don't think that we ought to just, you know, have children like bunnies and not provide for them because that is not the Christian thing to do either. And so I think that, you know, God has arranged where there are things you can do. And the only purpose, some, you know, there are some churches so extreme, they think that the only reason you have sex is to reproduce. You haven't read the Song of Solomon. Uh, you know, sex is also created by God for intimacy and love and relationship in marriages. And it's not just to keep... You know, the Bible said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Well, friends, I've got news for you. The earth is full. And so I think that we have fulfilled the command, and we need to be intelligent about planning our families. I already had more than my share. And so uh, for a guy named Bachelor, five's not bad, right? What is the abomination that causes desolation? Matthew 24, 15. Oh, it's not only in Matthew 24. It's in Daniel 12. It's in uh, the Gospel of Luke. Now, I'll show you something interesting. And I don't have time to look this up because we want to get to as many questions as we can tonight. We're short on time. Matthew 24, Jesus said, When you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, let him that reads understand, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. That's how Matthew says it. You go to Luke, and Luke says it this way, When you therefore see Jerusalem compassed with armies, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. Well, the abomination of desolation... Remember I told you, and uh, some prophecies have dual application. When Jesus talked about his coming and the end of the world, that's an example of that. The abomination of desolation for the Jews was when the Romans surrounded Jerusalem, they destroyed and desolated the temple, and it was never rebuilt to this present day. The Roman power was the abomination that desolated God's people there. They surrounded them. In the last days again, it's going to be the same power God's people are going to be surrounded with this, this beast uh, trinity that's going to come together. The beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. I've told you Protestants, and I happen to be one, Catholics, Charismatics, are going to unite for the purpose of making religious laws. They're going to surround Bible Christians with these laws, and that will be our signal to, to flee. We're going to be compelled to worship a certain way. Why is it not acceptable to say the same prayer until it is answered? Is this a sign of lack of faith? Now, I, I share it in the Bible in Matthew where Jesus said, pray not in vain repetition. Some have confused this to mean that you're not supposed to pray the same prayer. How many of you pray over your food every day? Is that vain repetition if you did it yesterday? No, that's not what Jesus is talking about. How many of you pray for your children every day? See what I'm talking about? That's not vain repetition. If you've got a health problem and you're praying for healing, it's okay to pray for that. Now, you know, the Lord may tell you to stop praying. He did Paul. Paul prayed three times for his health problem, and God said, this is a thorn you're going to have to live with. But um, praying in vain repetition is when a person, right in one sitting, says the same prayer over and over again. 
you know, like saying 20 Our Fathers and 10 Hail Marys. That's saying the same prayer over and over again. That's vain repetition. That's not a cry of your heart. Uh, yeah, I used to go to Hare Krishna temple, I told you, and they would say over and over and over again, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Is that prayer? No, prayer is the cry of an intelligent mind to the mind of God. Don't insult him. He's not deaf. It's okay to pray every day over the same thing until you get an answer. That's why Jesus said, ask. Why do you say that the NIV is a bad translation? Which translation of the Bible do you feel is most accurate and why? And, and again, I don't want to be slanderous to those of you who are embracing the NIV. In my humble opinion, it, I think, is a very biased translation. You can look at some of the contributors, and, and I think that there have been a lot of bias incorporated. Uh, the NIV incorporated a lot of conclusions from the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts, which I think are questionable manuscripts. And uh, uh, I like the King James and the New King James Version that are translated from the Textus Receptus. I think it's one of the, the... And I'm not saying the King James translation is flawless either. I've shown you a few discrepancies in punctuation, right? But me personally, I feel the most comfortable with uh, those versions. How do you know when it's the right time to get baptized? Another question. Well, first of all, if you're thinking about it, that could be the Holy Spirit working in your life. Uh, you may not have a desire later. The best time to do God's will is when you know God's will. If you've met the biblical criteria of understanding what God's will is for you, being willing to do His will, submit your life to Him, being sorry for your sins, accepting Jesus as your sacrifice, and you want to begin a new life as a Christian, baptism is the next step. Marry the Lord. Commit your life to Him. That's what baptism is. Please explain Revelation 17.10, which talks about seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other one is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. Okay, one more question after this one, dear. Let me do this real quick. Revelation 17.10. Now, the Bible says the woman sits on a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Now, that's another example of double application. Those seven heads, first of all, apply to the seven hills of Rome. But also in the Bible, a mountain represents a kingdom. There are in the Bible seven kingdoms that have persecuted God's people when you trace the history from the Old to the New Testament that have occupied them, persecuted them, carried them away. Those kingdoms are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the Roman Empire went through a transition and it was the Holy Roman Empire also became a persecuting power. He says here five are fallen. When John wrote Revelation, what five persecuting powers were fallen? Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Five are fallen. One is, who was ruling the world when John wrote Revelation? Rome. Rome was, he said, he will fall away, but he'll also be the eighth. Or he'll come back again, in other words. Rome did. They received a deadly wound, and they came back. Came back as papal Rome, was wounded, and returned again. And he was also the eighth, the seventh and the eighth. See what I'm saying? Our lesson tonight, does God inspire astrologers and psychics? Very timely lesson. I don't know what it's like here in Michigan, but back in California, there's a lot of companies that tell you you can dial these 900 numbers and get your personal psychic reader. Do you have that out here too? Yes? No? Yeah? I think I told you one of my friends called one of these numbers. The first thing they said is, can we have your credit card number? He said, you're the prophet. You tell me. <laughs> but there's a lot of this going on, a lot of supernatural phenomenon. Question number one. Does the Bible teach there will be true prophets in the last days? Now, you read these answers with me. And this is Acts chapter 2, 17. In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Will the gift of prophecy be in the earth in the last days? What does the Bible say? Absolutely. Question number two. Jesus, at his ascension, place the gift of prophets in his church along with the other gifts, apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why did God place these gifts in the church? Do we need these gifts? Here's the answer. Say it with me. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, when you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul contrasts the gift of prophecy with the gift of tongues in that chapter. That's what he's doing. And he's saying the most important gift is the gift of prophecy he goes on to say, because the gift of prophecy edifies. And you know how you say the word building in Spanish or Latin? Edificio. It's, it builds up the church, the gift of prophecy. Do we still need building up in the church? And you could read 1 Corinthians 14 and substantiate that. 
Absolutely, we need these gifts. Question number three. In the Bible days, was the gift of prophecy limited to men? What's the answer? No. Uh, God speaks through holy men and women. There's a number of examples in the Bible. Miriam, incidentally, Jochebed and Amram had three children. All three of them were prophets. Aaron, Moses, and Miriam were prophets. Two of them were priests. The men were priests. The woman was also a prophetess. And I think that's a Bible pattern. I think you'll find a lot of examples in the Bible of women who were prophets or prophetess, but may not have been priests. And some people had both gifts. Samuel was a priest and a prophet. So was Mer Moses and uh, Aaron. But um, we just read that verse there in Acts 2.17. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. When? In the last days. Number four, how long were these gifts to remain in the church? Now, friends, you're going to be surprised. I think most of you agree that the gifts of the spirit are needed all the way to the end. Amen? You'd be surprised how many churches say all the miracles and all the gifts stopped with the apostles. Oh, that'd be a really pathetic church to be part of, a church that has no power. I think we need these things right to the end. Jesus said, these miracles that I have done, greater things than these will you do because I go to the Father. And that's why he sends the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's read it together. Till we, this is Ephesians 4, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Well, that is a perfect high ideal. Everybody who's arrived at this condition, let me see your hand. Well, then we must still need the gifts in the Spirit in the church, right? He says, when you come to this, you need these gifts until you come to this place. Number five, from what source do true prophets obtain their information? Answer, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is where I get my prophetic information. Just kidding. How many of you see these things on the, uh, the newsstands? These are just uh, last months. What's ahead in your future? A hundred prophecies by the world's greatest seers. And uh, I don't know. They, they, they threw in Billy Graham and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Pope. And you know, the interesting thing is, I'm not sure about the Pope, but Billy Graham and Martin Luther King Jr. never claimed to be prophets. I think it's interesting they threw them in. Final prophecies, America's greatest prophet. And they put Edgar Cayce in as the greatest prophet. Well, I think most of I hope nobody here buys these magazines. I wouldn't admit it if I did right now. Is this where we get our information about prophecy? You know, one of the famous psychics that fits in this group, she almost always has a column, is Jean Dixon. And she says she's a prophet of God because she has 75% accuracy. Well, so does the weatherman but that doesn't make him a prophet of God. I mean, Gene Dixon will say, mm, Elizabeth Taylor is going to get married again. Oh, do you need to be a prophet? You no know, stuff like that. She's going to get divorced again. She'll go on a diet again. I mean, these are the kind of things. Do the prophets of God deal with movie stars? You know, someone took a series of prophecies that Gene Dixon and some of the others did back in the 70s, and they checked them about what was going to happen that year. She said that uh, Nixon would survive the Watergate scandal. He would not do anything that required him to resign or be impeached. Uh, wrong. Said that Gerald Ford would run with a woman running mate for vice president. Wrong. I could just go down the line. Made a whole bunch of predictions that did not happen. I don't think she has 70%. Where do we get our information about a true prophet? From the Bible. Number six. God speaks to prophet in prophets in three different ways. Now, I added a fourth. What are these ways? If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. I'll speak to him in a dream, and I'll speak to him mouth to mouth. And the fourth one I added is with an angel. Now, hasn't God also spoken to his prophets through angels? And perhaps uh, the writer of the lesson was also including, well, uh, that would be a vision of an angel. But... Uh, an angel is the one I sent and signified it by his angel, brought the message to Revelation to John. So God speaks to his prophets through dreams, visions, angels, and like Abraham and Moses, mouth to mouth, face to face. Number seven, when these prophets are in vision or dreams, sometimes there's physical phenomenon that accompanies this, and we've given you some scriptures. Answer A, or number seven, what are the physical evidences of a true prophet in vision? will initially lose physical strength. 
They might physically, as they are, they're taken into the spirit, lose their physical strength, and then they later get supernatural, be spiritual strength. Answer C, they stop breathing. Answer D, they're able to speak, but they're in a trance. You also find this with Balaam. They won't be aware of their earthly surroundings. Their eyes might be open. And there's only a few examples of a prophet in vision given in the Bible, but sometimes these are the supernatural evidences that are seen when they're in a vision. Number eight, now we're going through the ways you know a true prophet from a false. Is the working of great miracles proof that a prophet is of God? What's the answer? They could be the spirits of devils working miracles. A lot of uh, shenanigans go on. And you know, there are some good people who might be able to work miracles and it doesn't mean they're a prophet. Now, Karen and I have such a close relationship that I don't know, should we go ahead and show them, dear? We thought we'd do a demonstration for you. We, the reason we got married is we just bonded mentally, spiritually, and every other way. And I can close my eyes and sometimes tell what she sees. We're that close. Does that mean I'm a prophet? We're going to demonstrate this to you. I, I think there's a blindfold hanging off the microphone there. This is a, I'm, I'm being honest with you, this is a 100% unseeable uh, headband. Go ahead and just don't mess up it my hair. Purple, my favorite color. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't mess up my hair. <laughs> I'll take care of that one that's standing straight up. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you pull it out, there nothing from nothing is nothing, right? Okay. Okay. I'm going to turn my back. I'm going to pull this down right now, make sure I can't see. Not only is this closed, but you know I'm honest. My, my eyes are can, closed. Are I know. Am here? I facing the back? Yeah. Okay, what, well. What shall we do first? Well, go stand by somebody, and uh, I'll, t uh, let me see. You're walking down the left aisle now. I just see what she sees. I've got this mm. feeling. Go put, put your hand. Put your hand on a person, over a person's head. I, I seem to see an, an elderly saint. It's, it's a lady. And a great, great hair. And um, let me think, what Can is she smile? wearing? She's got a blue sweatshirt on. And uh, what else? A blue sweatshirt, and I can't... Focus, dear. Stare at her. Focus. I got to see what you're seeing. White collar. A white collar, I see. Am I right so far, folks? So, so far, yes, you're right on. I think her first name is even Su Susan. Is that your name? Yes, that's, it's Susan. That's right. It's Susan. Okay. All right. Wow. Susan, did I'm you know? Impressed. Did we consult with you in advance? No. No? no see, I can even no. go beyond what Karen sees sometimes. Pick someone else, dear. Anybody. Pick someone else. Okay. Take a volunteer. They think we're setting this up. Well, we, we, we don't want to, you're, you're so close, he'll already know. I can't focus, dear, unless you make up your mind. Okay, well, I'm hurrying. It's really something when you think what Karen here. thinks. Where's my hand? She's going up the center aisle, I just feel that now. And pick somebody, dear. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> you got a young man now. I think he's wearing kind of a golden beige sweater. Uh-huh. Uh, does, does he work with deceased people? Let's see. Do you, brother? Is that what you do? You got dark hair? Is that what you do? Yeah, yeah he does, he said. Is it Ra R Rick? Yeah. Rick? Yes, Ron? It, Rick? It, is Rick his name is Rick. That's correct. Okay. All right. Well, dear, I think they got the point. Let's see wow. if, if uh, we can demonstrate something else here for the faithless among us. How about some scripture? Do you know I have a photographic memory? How many of you realize that I have a photographic memory? You believe that, huh? <laughs> All right, somebody, someone give Karen any chapter in the Bible. Open your Bibles. Pick any chapter in the someone Bible. Someone do a book and then pick, a chapter. Someone pick a chapter, someone else pick a verse, so you'll know we're not setting this up, okay? How about a book? Pick a book. Okay. And then a chapter and then a verse. Do I have a book? Psalms. We heard our Psalms. Psalms. Everybody turn to Psalms. Somebody pick a chapter in Someone Psalms. Don't make it like 23, because you all know that one too, right? Yeah, I know that one. Pick a tough one. Tell me a number. 119. Psalms have... 119, the longest one in the Bible. Okay, verse 95. You want the whole thing? We don't have time. Psalms 119, verse 95? Yes. Is that what you said? Yes. I want everyone to look up and you check on me, okay? Tell me when you all have that. I think it's even on page 949 in your seminar Bibles. Is that right? Okay. Would you like me to start reading that? 
The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is, well, let me think, what are, thy commandment is exceeding broad. That's right. How's that? Did I get it right? Did I miss a word in the King James Version? Do you want it in the NIV? I don't know the NIV. <laughs> How many of you are impressed? Oh, let me show you something here. What's wrong, dear? You have something in your ear? There's someone in the studio who is telling me everything that they see on camera. When you quote a scripture, they are reading it to me in the studio, and they were looking at the camera who Karen was standing by. Now, you know why I'm doing this? Not to make you lose confidence in me. But I don't want you to be gullible. You would be amazed how many people out there have been fooled. And you know, Amazing Facts, incidentally, did not buy this for this stunt. We use this for a teleprompter, because I don't read a teleprompter. I can't read very well. So I talk into a microphone, and I read my script back to myself when we're doing scripts uh, on TV. And I stick this in my ear. Well, we thought, hey, we could use this to illustrate something to the people. There was a minister a little while ago. Everyone thought he had a divine power. They would interview people in the lobby, and then he'd say, there's someone here, your name is Manuel, you need this healing, you got problems in your marriage, and folks were astounded at his prophetic gift. It was a gag. Now, not all of what happens out there is a gag. Some of it is the devil fooling people. Amen? There's a lot of things going on that are not the Holy Spirit, but the devil does deceive too. A lot, and a lot of folks are gullible. How many of you have driven down the road and you see these signs that say, um, psychic, palm reader? Most of that is tricks, and these people, usually it involves getting money from you. Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I hope you're learning new things from today's study. If you are, I'd like very much to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, your comments, and especially your prayer requests. Our office staff at Amazing Facts gathers every day to pray over each one of them. If you'd like to know more about how to obtain this video series, you can call us or write. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. And our toll-free number is 1-800-835-6906. Why don't you give us a call or write us a letter? God bless you, and I thank you in advance. Number nine. Of what perilous end-time danger does Jesus warn us? There shall arise, say it with me, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. I remember a friend of mine was a uh, sensational evangelist and he was converted to the truth. He said he'd go to these tent meetings and sometimes they'd go from town to town with these small tent meetings and they had a band of actors that went with them that would feign healing, real remarkable things. And a lot of it was frauds. Then they'd get people from the audience and they'd say, you'd be surprised how many times people would say they had pain in their back. I want to ask that question again. You ever seen a minister go, there's someone out there and God's telling me you have a problem with headaches. How many out there have problems with headaches? Let me see your hands. <laughs> Probably too much sugar is what it is. <laughs> but, uh, or they'd say, you have pain in your lower back. And he'd bring these people up. And they'd sit down and he'd say, the Lord's telling me the reason you've got pain is one leg is longer than the other and you're walking uneven. I'm going to heal it and I'm going to make your leg grow. You'd be surprised how many legs have grown in tents all around the country. And so they'll sit a person down and they'll go like this. Look at that. Did you know I had one leg longer than the other? I can, I'm ambidextrous. I can do either leg. <laughs> longer than the other. And the minister would do this, and you know, everybody's got one leg maybe a little longer than the other. And he'd push it and pull it, and they'd say, oh, it's a miracle. I watched a leg grow. You can move your hips and make that happen. Most of us. 
There are so many things that are done, and they say that this is the Holy Spirit. This is the power of God. Now, I believe in real miracles. How many of you believe in real miracles? I do. I've been healed. I believe in God's power, but I believe the devil is in the business of counterfeiting and deceiving. Amen? And we want to be careful that we're not gullible. Now, I am not so worried. Oh, you know another thing they do? Is they would shock people and tell them they were slain in the spirit. Minister would ground himself, he'd have a zapper on, he'd touch them, they'd fall to the ground, and then you interview them. I've seen it on TV many, many times. You interview them, they say, what did it feel like? Well, it's like electricity. The Holy Spirit's like electricity. Well, it was electricity, dummy. <laughs> you were shocked. You were not filled with the spirit. You were filled with volts. <laughs> and these dear people are very sincere. And then, hey, now wouldn't you be impressed? You know, I could have put on a show tonight and taken up an offering, you would have written big checks. But I won't do that because I'm not that kind of person. But you know why they do this? Because then they take big offerings and that's how they're able to afford these enormous auditoriums. If a person really believes that this fellow is raising the dead and doing these miracles, they'll, they'll empty their banks for him. Number 10, how can I determine whether a prophet is true or false? National Enquirer, what does the Bible say? Go, and if you look in the Bible, Isaiah 8, 20, say it with me. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Number 11. There are certain types of prophets specifically named and condemned in the Bible. Let's look at what some of those are. Uh, a charmer, answer A. Observer of times, that's an astrologer. Do you know my mother... I grew up in New York City. All of her friends were into astrology. You'd meet somebody before you even asked their name. You'd say, what sign are you? I'm a Pisces. I'm an Aquarius with a Leo rising. And that's what all the hippies were saying in New York City. And my mother started writing songs. She wrote an, an album of astrology love songs she recorded. Twelve songs, one for each zodiac, to find out who your compatible love soulmate would be, according to the stars. I said, Mom, do you believe that stuff? She said, are you kidding me? People buy that and they believe it. She had friends that used to write zodiacs, uh, uh, astrological readings, and they'd put them in the newspaper, and we'd ask them, do you really believe that? She said, no, but it pays good. People all over the country are buying these magazines to find out what their lucky stars have to say, and the people writing it don't even believe it. Gullible. Astrology. Now, that's different from the legitimate study of the heavens called astronomy. I'm very interested in astronomy. A sorcerer, someone who claims to contact spirits of the dead, should Christians be involved in Ouija boards and sorcery? You read in the Bible about King Saul. God said, do not consult a familiar spirit. He went to a witch. He consulted a familiar spirit. He and his three oldest sons died the next day. God does not want us doing that. If you want information, go to God in the Bible. Amen? Don't go to the devil. Consult her with familiar spirits, a user of divination, a fortune teller. I had a friend that... Uh, some of you have heard of uh, an actor named Red Buttons. He's an Academy Award winner. He, he was friends of ours growing up. His wife, Alicia, read my palm. She was a, uh, well, she may still be, Red's still alive. And uh, she was uh, kind of a self-proclaimed psychic. And she read my palm and she says, I can see here you're going to hurt your hand. Now, this is before I was a Christian. You're going to injure yourself. And I allowed her to read my palm. Well, you know what? I injured my hand. I've got a scar right here to show it. And I thought, wow, heavy. How'd she know that? If you consult these people, some of their prophecies will come true. It's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because of your faith, it may happen. Jesus said, you've got a power of faith in you. You start having faith in these people, and some things may happen, but you're dabbling with the devil. You're selling your soul when you start fooling with that sort of stuff. Christians ought to stay away. Amen? If you want to see the power of faith, direct your faith towards Jesus and watch what happens when he saves you from your sins rather than winning lotteries and reading palms and things. Where was I? Number, a necromancer, that's a sorcerer, a fortune teller, an enchanter, a witch, a wizard. You know what these things are. Stay away from this stuff. Number 12. Oh, incidentally, one way you can know really quick the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet, if the prophet submits a bill for their prophecy, they're suspicious. I've never yet seen in the Bible where John the Baptist said, uh, the one who comes after me is mightier than I, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, and that will be 995. <laughs> Prophets of God give the message of God regardless of whether they get anything or not. Amen? They're doing it because they're constrained by the Holy Spirit to share the truth. As soon as you walk into one of these fortune teller places, they want your credit card, they want you to get your checkbook out, they want to charge you for their prophecy. 
That makes it suspicious. Number 12, is a true prophet's work primarily to serve the church or to serve unbelievers? What's the answer in the Bible study guide? The church. The gift of prophecy is there to edify, to build up the church, uh, not unbelievers. You know, if I read some of the great prophecies of the Bible to people on the street, what does it do for them? They think I'm a kook. But when you open the Word of God and read from the prophets in church, it has power. It's, it's accepted then. Amen? Number 13. Does God end time church have the gift of prophecy? Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, 17. I want to do a real quick Bible study with you. And the dragon, who is that? The dragon was wroth with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus. What is that? Well, two characteristics of God's people are they keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. When you don't understand a phrase in the Bible, what do you do? Look other places in the Bible and allow the Bible to explain itself. It's its own best translator. Go with me to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. John is being led through this vision by an angel. And after he sees these things, in verse 10, I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See thou do it not. Do not worship me. I'm just an angel. I am my fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right. Notice this. Two characteristics of God's people that the dragon is mad at they keep the commandments. How many commandments would that be? Nine, ten, eight, seven, six, ten. The Bible says, Oh, that my people would keep all of my commandments always, that it might be well with them. Everybody keeps some of them some of the time, right? God wants us to be consistently obedient. And they have the testimony of Jesus. What does Gabriel tell us the testimony of Jesus is? Spirit of prophecy. The commandments and the spirit of prophecy, the law and the prophets characteristic of God's church. And not only does that mean that they'll be preaching and proclaiming the Word of God, the Law, and the Prophets, the two witnesses, Elijah and Moses, if you will, uh, Moses being the Law, Elijah being the Prophets. Incidentally, listen to the last thing it says in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. I don't have a photographic memory, but I have memorized a lot of Scripture. Behold, oh no, wait. Remember ye the Law of Moses, my servant, which I gave unto him for all Israel in Mount Horeb with its statutes and judgments, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Remember the law of Moses. Behold, I send you Elijah. Then you turn into the New Testament. What two resurrected, glorified humans visit Jesus? On the Mount of Transfiguration. There's an experience in the Bible where Moses and Elijah literally appear to Jesus. The law and the prophets. But even more than that, I believe it's telling us that God's church in the last days will have an understanding of the law and the gift of the prophets still alive among them. All the gifts of the Spirit should be in God's church. Amen? Because we're not home yet. Amen? We need them. And we're going to share a couple more things as we go on here. Fourteen. When you join God's church, in time church, that has the gifts, how will it affect you? Why do we do this? That henceforth we should no more be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning, craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. I showed you a little bit tonight about how some pastors are deceiving people. Friends, I don't want anyone following me. I've got enough trouble getting myself to the kingdom. I want you to follow Jesus. Amen? And you'll, you'll, I'm a complete failure if you start following me. I want you to follow the Bible. What am I teaching from through, through the seminar? Am I saying, follow Doug? Or am I continually saying, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Get your information from the Bible. You know why there's so many denominations? Because people are following pastors. They're being led around with every wind of doctrine. And they're lacking some of the gifts of the Spirit in the church. If we would go by the law and the prophets, we wouldn't be a fraction like this. It's not God's plan that the Christian church be so divided. How many of you agree with me that Jesus is sad that the church is so split up and divided? Jesus said, all men will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. And Christians are killing each other in the name of Jesus. Do you agree before the Lord comes back that genuine Christians are going to need to unite on the Scriptures? Do you agree with me on that? Does that stand to reason then that some of us are going to have to make some changes if we're going to come together? I don't think we ought to come together for the sake of unity. I think we should unite on truth. That should be the reason that we unite. Not just for the sake of being warm and fuzzy, but what does the Bible say? Number 15, the Apostle Paul 
in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 18, he likens the gifts that Jesus gave the church to parts of the body. What part of the body best represents the gift of prophecy? Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So what part of the body would the gift of prophecy be likened unto? The eyes. How many of you appreciate being able to see? I had an injury once where I had one eye covered up, and I was amazed how much we need our vision and uh, how dependable, how much we depend on our sense of vision. Does the church still need this gift in its midst? What happens when you've got the blind leading the blind? Everybody falls in the ditch. Do we need the gift of prophecy in the church? Absolutely. Number 16, since prophecy is the eyes of the church, a church without the gift of prophecy would be in what condition? Blind. That's a very sad condition indeed to be in. That's what Jesus accused his people of being in when they reject the prophets. What did Jesus say just before he, he was slain? He came down the Mount of Olives and he wept over Jerusalem and said, you stone the prophets. They accepted the false and rejected the true. And because they stoned the prophets, they did not accept him. And then he said, you are blind leaders of the blind. Why? They rejected the prophets. Number 17, must God's remnant church have all the gifts he, that he gave? You know, I think that Christ is coming back for a church that will be very much like the church he left behind. I think there's a restoration that takes place. It began, remember what we read? 2,300 days then the sanctuary, the church, temple in heaven, and the temple on earth will be cleansed. God is cleansing the people by not only taking away the false doctrines, but he's restoring the real gifts to the church before he comes back. That's what's happening, and it's even happening right now for those watching and those here. Number 18. Revelation 12, 17 points out that God's end-time remnant church will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We just read that. Revelation 19, 10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Can we be sure this means the church will have a prophet? Well, not only did the angel say in Revelation 19 that I'm, a, I'm of your brethren, the servants, Revelation 22, verse 9, he says, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets. So some of the brethren that would be there in the last days would be prophets. We read, I'll pour out my spirit in the last days and your sons and daughters will do what? Prophesy. Is it safe to say that before Jesus comes back, there'll be prophecy? I think so. Number 19, of what other special significance are the words, the testimony of Jesus? The testimony of Jesus means the words of the prophet are the words of who? Jesus speaks to us, not usually in person, but the Lord speaks to us through his representatives. Now, I, don't, I do not want to be um, glorifying myself, but I hope Jesus speaks to you through me. Uh, if it's just Doug talking, we can all leave right now because I have no authority in myself. If I am allowing Christ to speak through me, I think the Lord speaks through his representatives. I'm not a prophet. Don't misunderstand. One of the words used for prophecy in the Bible means the prophet like Elijah that tells the future and calls down fire from heaven. But in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul speaks of prophecy as preaching. Part of prophecy is preaching. How many of you know that? Let me see your hands. Okay. So that's one of the gifts. Jesus wants to speak to us through the gifts of the Spirit, and that is one of the gifts, prophecy. Number 20, what are the Bible qualifications for a true or genuine prophet? A, live a godly life. B, be called to service by the Lord, special calling. C, speak and write in harmony with Scripture. D, predict accurately, 100% accurately, events that will come true. E, will have visions, dreams. Now, I want to pause. We're going to do something we've not done before. History tells us in the Bible that every time God prepares to do something significant, He does not raise up programs, in organizations, God's problem is not that he needs more money. What God needs is not better methods. He needs better men and women. Whenever God did something stupendous in the Bible, he did it through somebody. When God was preparing to save the world from a catastrophic flood, who did he use? Noah, Enoch, to prepare the people. When God was going to save a whole nation from slavery and march them through an ocean, lead them into the promised land. Did he get a committee or did he raise up somebody? 
What was his name? When the Lord was preparing to lead them into the promised land, he used Joshua. When the Lord was getting ready to deliver them from the, the enemies that were coming from the north with Sisera, he raised up a prophetess named Deborah. When the Lord was preparing to destroy Jerusalem because of their sins, he sent a prophet to warn God's people so they need not be destroyed. His name was Jeremiah, Isaiah. When he was getting ready to lead them back, he raised up Ezekiel, Daniel, or Daniel, then Ezekiel after they, they went back home. When he was going to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city, Nehemiah, Ezra, whenever God did anything spectacular in the Bible, when Jesus was getting ready to come the first time, didn't he send a prophet in advance to prepare the people? Did he? What was his name? John the Baptist. Now here we are, friends. We're on the threshold of the great crescendo, the climax of the whole plan of salvation. Jesus is getting ready to come. The mark of the beast and all these events that have pointed to this age in which we're living. And you think all of a sudden God's not going to use people anymore? He's not going to raise up spirit-filled men and women to guide his flock? That would be a really strange assumption from the pattern that we see in the past. Well, I believe that he's done that. Now, every great movement has its leaders, its inspired leaders. I believe, I'm not a Lutheran, but I believe the Lord raised up Martin Luther. Now there's a Lutheran church. I don't agree with all their conclusions, but I believe that he led people a long way out of darkness. One of my great heroes is John Wesley. God used him to bring a great revival to England and North America. I'm not a Methodist because I don't agree with all those things. And John Wesley led the people so far and then he died. But God used people. Every movement has inspired leaders. This movement is not an exception. Now, some movements have inspired or leaders they claim are inspired, but their lives were not in harmony with their profession. John Wesley, Martin Luther, Calvin, who was one of the founders for the Baptist, godly people. They tried to stick to the Bible. There's some of these other movements, and they're saying, our writings are equal with the Bible. Watch out for anyone who says that. You hear me? I believe that when the Lord raised up the movement that I'm a part of and in love with, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, he used a young lady who was 17 years old, very frail health. Her name then was Ellen Gould Harmon, later married a young minister named James White, commonly known now as Ellen G. White, because White is such a common name. Sometimes they throw the middle initial in there to delineate. Doctors didn't think she was going to live to be 17. When she was 17, she had her first vision. She continued to have visions for a nice round number of 70 years. She wrote more, you ought to respect her if for no other reason because she wrote more than any other woman in American history. One man wrote more than Ellen White. You know who it is in America? Benjamin Franklin. That's quite an accomplishment considering she had a third grade education. Formal education ended at third grade. Then she wrote more on more different subjects. She wrote on health, agriculture, science, uh, organization, administration, uh, just so many fields, and her writings are still being translated and published today because it's current. I believe she was inspired. Now, this is very precious to me because when I lived up in the cave, I was reading the Bible. I never heard of Seventh-day Adventists, never heard of Ellen White. And I was praying, Lord, I'd go visit these different churches. I studied with the Mormons, Latter-day Saints. A lot of nice people in all different churches, lovely people. They said, unless you're a member of our church and you're married in the temple and all this, you're not going to make it. And they had a prophet. Well, I came to find out, of course, their prophet was killed because he told some of his people to destroy a printing press, had more than one wife, and they kind of got upset about that. A lot of really strange things happened. I started being suspicious. Studied with Jehovah Witnesses. They had a spiritual leader. I think it was Charles Russell. Is that what his name was? And uh, wife divorced him, sued him. Uh, a lot of strange things happened. Finally, they started saying, well, he's not inspired, but the magazine, the Watchtower Society, it's inspired. Then you got uh, Mary Baker Eddy, inspired leader of the Christian scientists, they claim. Her writings don't go along with the Bible. She kind of lived in isolation, in a mansion, had a lot of money that came in from her writings. Ellen White, on the other hand, her children all stayed with the message she taught. You know something I've learned? You can fool people, but you cannot fool your kids. Well, I started reading, all, studying with all these different churches. I got away from my story here. They all disagreed. All the churches said, unless you're a member of this church and you speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Unless you're a member of this church and you're baptized a certain way, you don't, you're not going to be saved. I went back home and I said, Lord, 
There's one Bible, one Jesus, one Holy Spirit. It makes sense to me there's one truth. I said, I want you to show me the truth. Help me understand the Bible. Everybody's trying to help me understand the Bible, and they're twisting it to their own personal opinions, private interpretations. After I prayed that prayer, 3,500 feet up in the desert mountains, living in a cave, somebody brought me a book called The Great Controversy. And I read that book. Now, I had never been to an Adventist church, and I read that book, and I thought, whoever wrote this book was inspired. You hear me? I was not being told that from a church denomination. I'd never been there, up in a cave. This friend of mine who shared these books with me, he started sharing others. He was living in a cave up higher than me. And I started reading a number of her writings that are basically an inspired commentary of the Bible. She's always talking about the Bible. If you've learned or enjoyed anything that you've received during the seminar, I wish I could take the credit, but you know who really gets the credit? I learned so much from reading the writings of Ellen White. And I'm, not everything, but the majority of what I share is not original with me. I think God gave it to her. And the scriptures, just her principles of interpretation are what I'm using with you. And things I found out I don't find in her writings came from her principles of biblical interpretation. And you know what? No matter what I read in the Bible now, it starts becoming clear. I believe that she was inspired by God. Now, let me quickly read through some of these questions. The last half of this lesson deals with her. First of all, I've had the privilege of meeting Paul Harvey. How many of you have heard his radio broadcast? You even get that here in Michigan, huh? Good. Thought it was too cold for radio in the winter. Newscaster Paul Harvey said she wrote with such profound understanding on the subject of nutrition that all but two of the many principles she espoused have been specifically established, and the others will still be. In other words, the others have been studied and have been substantiated by modern science. She's the fourth most translated writer of all time. That's something to consider. Now, I've given you question number 21. Did God send a prophet? I believe he did in the last days. Incidentally, you say, well, Ellen White died and, and Jesus hasn't come yet. Did Moses die before the children of Israel crossed over? And does that mean he wasn't a prophet? No, he led them so far. Did they still use Moses' writings after he died? That's right. And I think God sent somebody to help us cross over. Number 22, did Ellen White have visions? Absolutely. And she had these phenomena that you see in the visions where she was in a trance, sometimes not breathing for half an hour, and doctors were there non-believing doctors held mirrors up to confirm they went pale. They said, she's not breathing. She's sitting up and she's moving. Holding up a great big 20-pound Bible like this, a frail little girl for 20 minutes without flinching, pointing to the scriptures, reading. And she didn't have a microphone in her ear either. And she did that. They didn't have those back then. Number 23, are Ellen White's words intended to be part of the Bible or in addition to the Bible? No. What have I been preaching to you here at this seminar for the last... 24 nights or whatever we've been. Have I been preaching Ellen White or Bible, Bible, Bible? That's what she told me to do. She never said, preach me. She said, go back to the Bible. That's the sign of a real prophet. They don't take the glory on themselves. And you know what else? Real prophets typically don't call themselves prophets. When they went to John the Baptist and said, are you that prophet? Are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness. If you went to Ellen White and said, are you a prophet? She'll say, no, but God gave me a dream and a message and a vision. I'm sharing it with you. She didn't want to. Very timid but was constrained to do it. Most of the income from her books went right back into spreading the message or establishing Christian education. You can tell if a person's greedy. If they're frauds, they're usually greedy. But she didn't have any of those tendencies. Was a very generous lady. Those who are her neighbors said this was the most Christian woman that we knew. Number 24, does Ellen White speak in harmony with Scripture? Absolutely. Everything she said is riddled and saturated with references in Scripture. You know, and you know, it's not fair that we should ask you. I mean, that'll take us to number 25. How can I accept Ellen White as a true prophet since I don't know what she wrote? Come and see. What does the Bible say? Now, this, let's go by the Bible, amen? The Bible says, prove all things. Try the spirits. Hold fast to that which is good. You know one reason after I studied with the Jehovah Witnesses, I decided not to go with them? is because I said, you know, I've been learning some new things. I want you to read this. They said, no, we can't read that. So what do you mean? Try this. If they come to your door, and I'm not trying to be unkind, offer them something that your church publishes and see if they read it. They're not allowed to read other church publications, which means that their beliefs are not able to stand up under investigation. It's like having a horse run with blinders on, lest they see something else. Well, you know what? I'm not afraid for the members of my church to study. I think I told you that a Presbyterian brother got mad at me because some of his members were joining our church. He said, how'd you like me to steal your sheep? I said, go ahead. 
he started studying with one of our brand new members. She knew the, better, the Bible better than he did. He came back, and I don't even think he meant to say it, but he said, I said, how you getting? How you coming along with Shar? He said, oh, she knows the Bible too well. I'm not getting anywhere. <laughs> That's right. So you find out for yourself. You've got to be noble. Prove these things to see whether they're so. Amen? I don't think it's fair for someone to say, well, I'm telling you our church teaches Ellen White's a prophet. You've got to believe that. Find out for yourself. Taste and see. Amen? See if it matches up with the Bible. See if she spends her time talking about herself or Jesus, 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 all the time. Jesus. That's what really converted me. Reading her, the, one of the most beautiful books ever written on the life of Christ, and this is the Library of the U.S. Congress. You know how many books there are on the life of Jesus? Desire of Ages, the book that she wrote, is at the top of the list. Well, you don't do that by being a fraud. She had insights that have transformed history. Number 26. What three-point command does Paul give us regarding a prophet? Answer, despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. You know, I went to a Pentecostal minister. I, I used to go to a Pentecostal church, and I read one of her books. He was telling me all these terrible things about Ellen White and how the Adventist church was a cult. How many of you have heard that before? Yeah, oh, pff, I'm sorry. I didn't know that many of you had heard that. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> What is a cult? A cult is a church that builds its teachings around an individual. Bible Christians are not considered to be a cult because they're going by the scriptures. Adventists are supposed to build their teachings around the Bible. Now, I want to say something else just to clear the air. Every denomination has people in it that are not balanced. Right? We've got more than our share, I'll just tell you right now. I do not judge any church by one or two people that go to that church. That's not fair. If I want to know what a church believes, I go to the foundational teachings of the church. Matter of fact, if you want to find out what a Baptist believes, you're going to be hard-pressed asking a Baptist. You better go to what their handbook says because most Baptists don't even know what they believe. Nothing personal, friends. But I've discovered that in preaching in Baptist churches. You ask 11 of them. There's 17 different divisions of the church. You get 12 different answers. Baptists will say we're not under the law. You go to their teachings, it says they do believe in keeping the Ten Commandments, and they don't even know that. Many Baptists now believe in the secret rapture, but you go to their teachings and some of the foundational writings of the patriarchs, they believe in a visible, literal second coming of Jesus like I've been preaching. A lot of these churches have great teachings in their foundation. The people don't even know it anymore. So don't go to one or two kooks. Every church has its kooks, right? And uh, there are folks in our church that are cultish. And I apologize for that. But let me ask you a question. Did Jesus and his 12 have a devil? The devil doesn't worry about planting his representatives and folks that aren't a threat. But if this movement that I'm telling you about is true, is the devil scared? Is he going to try and mix people up by having his representatives scattered there to confuse and deceive? So you're going to meet people that aren't balanced in their understanding. They may act a little cultish, but a genuine Seventh-day Adventist goes by the Bible. Amen? Amen. Number 27, how does Jesus regard the rejection of the words or counsel of a genuine prophet, true prophet? Well, if the words of the prophet are coming from the Lord, in some degree it's a rejection of him. Any truth, even if it's Doug speaking truth through the Holy Spirit to you, I'm not a prophet, but notice this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth will set you free. And if you reject truth in any degree, to some extent you're rejecting Jesus. To some extent, you're in bondage because truth liberates. Be very careful not to reject truth, whatever the source. Amen? Truth is truth. Number 28. Do end-time prophets originate new doctrine or does the doctrine come strictly from the Bible? If it's not supported by the Bible, clear reason and the study of Scripture, then be careful. And I've not yet found, you know, I go all the way through these seminars, sometimes 32 hour and a half programs preaching the final end time message. And I get to the end and folks never know that I am also in 100% harmony with the writings of Ellen White. But I'm preaching it from the Bible. That's the only way I'm going to do it, friends. I've got to go by what the Bible says. It just so happens she happens to agree with that. And I'll tell you, if I find something in conflict, I'm going with the Bible. But so far, I've been very happy that her writings have been in harmony. Number 21, 29 is a fair question. Are you willing to test Ellen White's writings by Scripture? And if her counsel is in harmony with the Bible, accept it. And I hope that your answer is yes. What does the Bible say? Prove all things. No, wait, Doug, but what if it's not popular? Is that how a Christian thinks? 
Are we supposed to do what's popular or what's true? Can you tell me, what does the Bible say? Have there been some prophets in Bible times who were not popular? What did they call the Christians? A sect. They persecuted them, even in their own country. And those things are going to be repeated again. Friends, if you're waiting for the truth to be popular, it will never happen. But the truth is the truth is the truth, and it doesn't die and it doesn't change. And I encourage you, prove all things. You know, if you'd like to get something, we'll try and get you a book like Desire of Ages and Steps to Christ. Oh, I started telling you something. I gave a Pentecostal friend of mine who said that Seventh-day Adventists were a cult. I gave him one of her books. He didn't know she had written it. I tore out the inside page. I said, I read this book. I want to know what you think of it. He read it and said, it's wonderful. I said, well, you know who wrote that? Oh, he, was, he went pale when I told him it was written by Ellen White. He would have been biased. And so we've got to be read things for ourselves. We'll see if you contact us at Amazing Facts, those of you who are watching, we may have some things for you here at the seminar, so you can see for yourself if God does still speak through prophets and prophetess in the last days. Amen? Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I hope you're learning new things from today's study. If you are, I'd like very much to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, your comments, and especially your prayer requests. Our office staff at Amazing Facts gathers every day to pray over each one of them. If you'd like to know more about how to obtain this video series, you can call us or write. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. And our toll-free number is 1-800-835-6906. Why don't you give us a call or write us a letter? God bless you, and I thank you in advance.